All right, we've all probably been in this situation at some point in time. We have a question about something in Guild Wars 2 and we look to other people for guidance. Whether it's in-game or through an external resource, people are generally happy to help and they offer advice. But there is an issue. Even though the advice is technically correct and often great, it might lack context. And this lack of context can have huge implications for you. At best, the tips don't really help. At worst, they might actually set you back. In this video, we'll take a look at some things that are often repeated and we're gonna try to add some context of our own. And let's start with a big one. When you ask about making gold, there is always that one person who will tell you that a minimum wage job will beat any farm in the game. In any game for that matter. That's true, but show me one person who actually does this though. Even if we indulge for a second, why not min-max this as well and get promoted for even more gold per hour? It might cut into your playtime though. I'll admit, it's a fun fact to point out. But it doesn't really help the person asking the question. Instead, knowing why they need gold will lead to more accurate answers. And I'll show this with another example. We often tell new players that daily tier 4 fractals are some of the best gold they'll ever make. Which again, is very true. But a new player might not have the gear, the agony resistance or even know what to do in a fractal. If they're completely new and saving up for their first set of gear, a skin they like or maybe even a griffin, we should probably point them towards activities with a lower barrier to entry. This could be meta events and various farms, but it could also be group content like strikes or even the lower tier fractals. This doesn't mean we shouldn't point towards tier 4 fractals at all though, but it's a goal to aim for, not always the solution. The benefit of pointing them to other parts of the game is that it'll introduce them to various extra ways to acquire gear, other than crafting. And they can even already get started on farming map currencies or crystals from strikes to buy ascended gear later down the road. Let's stick to group content for a second and take a look at raids. We don't need agony resistance for those, or even ascended gear for that matter. All we need is a build from our website of choice, a set of exotic gear and we're basically good to go. People with a lot of raiding experience in other games will most likely do reasonably well in Guild Wars 2, even if they enter them relatively early on in their journey. But chances are, those people will ask more specific questions rather than the general how do I get into raids. If we're talking about new players, be it raiding, MMOs or even gaming in general, then some guidance might go a long way. I already discussed part of the gearing with fractals, but raids are actually a great introduction to maps such as Verdant Brink or even World v World, where you can obtain stat selectable gear. And this comes with the added benefit of not having to buy everything through the trading post. And we introduce some other parts of the game at the same time. What probably also will lead to a better experience for new players is understanding their profession, builds and even what roles they're supposed to cover rather than quickly copy-pasting a build from a website or a video. What is really great though is how many community-run resources there are available. The amount of discords that offer training or ways for groups to recruit new members, as well as the various websites that cover everything from builds to the actual mechanics of every single encounter. That's something where Guild Wars 2 and the community really shines. Another possible roadblock is finding a group through the in-game LFG. Discords partially help resolve this problem already, but another piece of advice we often see repeated is that they should make their own group, or buy a tag and make groups from that point onwards. The cost of a tag aside, making your own group is not always the answer for everyone. Some people won't have any issues doing so, but I'd wager there are enough players who will not only be intimidated by the coordination, they might also prefer some guidance the first few times. If you do group content consistently, it's evident you need quickness, alacrity and ideally a healer or two. But someone who hasn't done any group content in Guild Wars 2 might not realize just how impactful these things are. And that's not even mentioning how you might want to make sure you bring enough projectile blocks to Bone Skinner or the Aetherblade hideout, or what encounters become tedious without enough stability. There's probably even more nuanced information we can share. If you want to pug your raids, Mondays are often the best days. Everyone wants to clear them after the weekly reset. And I personally found more success for Wings 5 through 7 on Sundays, probably because a good amount of people want to finish the last few bosses before the next reset. I'll also be the first one to admit I was intimidated by making my own groups. Sometimes I still am, even though I know I have enough experience and I've done it a ton of times. Reality is that there is always gonna be people who will be more comfortable doing so than others. 
Raids are also a great way to acquire legendary gear. Not only do you get a nice chunk of gold from doing them, but you need to complete some achievements in Wings 1 through 4 for the armor and in Wings 5 through 7 for a legendary ring. Legendary gear is not only costly, but it's also time consuming. It makes for a great long term goal though, and the payoff is huge, as you can change your stats on the fly, which will basically allow you to play any build you can think of. A next logical question, therefore, is what slots people should prioritize. I noticed in the last few years, we've actually started to give more in depth answers, rather than the usual priority lists of trinkets first, armor second, and then runes and sigils, or maybe weapons. Even though I made my trinkets first as well, if I could do it all over, I would have started with the armor actually. And that's because I mainly played medium armor classes when I started my legendary journey. The amount of gold and resources I spent on Ascended gear, because I also wanted to be able to play everything in Fractals, would have probably netted me an extra legendary or two. As I said, we as a community now give better answers to the question. Trinkets are amazing if you like playing multiple classes at multiple armor weights, as those can be used by all 9 professions. And I already gave my example why armor would have benefited me more at the start. But I've also met players who went for runes and sigils first, simply because they didn't mind transferring the ascended gear between their characters, but they were running out of gold by changing runes every other week. Weapons for me were what I crafted in between time gated pieces. When I needed to wait a couple of weeks to get enough ally to craft my next piece of armor, adding a weapon to my collection was something I liked to do. I even found the time to craft a legendary weapon while I was doing all the return to achievements for the basically free legendary amulet. That one you can actually work on all the time and at your own pace. And let's finish with one more common statement. Anything works in the open world, or worse, open world is a joke. I don't like this statement for various reasons. But I will admit, it is true, but only if the players are skilled enough. Any challenge in the game can be done solo with glass cannon gear, but not by every player. Conversely, we sometimes like to forget the extra quality of life we would want in the open world, because we don't need it in group content. One of my favorite relics for example is Relic of the Chronomancer, even though I'd never take that anywhere else other than the open world. But I do like having an easy access to quickness even on specs like Scrap. Same with the weapons actually, everything works in the open world, but some will allow for smoother gameplay. If you take Thief as an example, then a shortbow is one of the best quality of life options in the game in the open world, in my opinion. But I rarely take it out in raids or strikes, except on rare occasions. So yes, everything works in the open world, but not everything will be great. Dragon's End taught us that when End of Dragons released. There are probably a ton more items I can add to this list, but I won't. If you liked the video, let me know in the comments and I might make a second one like this. And before you go, the like button is feeling particularly lonely these days, so if you could give it a quick click and subscribe to the channel while you're at it.